everyone. Okay, oh, sorry. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Wilma Marshall. I'm the MSEC for Scotland. Um, tonight, um, Roger Gillespie will deliver a presentation. Um, he'll give you some information on um, the pathways and also offer you some hints and tips on how to complete your application. There is a chat box um, there that you can pop some questions into if you want, and we can answer these at the end of the session. Um, Rod, uh, sorry, Brian, who would normally deliver this, is feeling poorly. So, sorry, Brian, hope you're better soon. Um, I'm now going to hand over to Roger. Can I just ask you quickly as well to please keep your cameras off and also mute um, your microphones. And again, as I say, any questions can be asked at the end of this session. Okay, thank you. Over to you, Brian. Thanks. Thanks, Wilma. Um, okay, so um, good evening, everybody. Um, so um, I'm not quite the um, late substitute, but I am filling in for, for Brian uh, today. And if any of you decide to go down the route of um, getting some assistance with your professional review, it is more than likely that will be Brian um, that will be assisting you. But um, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Roger Gillespie. I'm um, Managing Director of, of Training LMS, which is an organization that uh, pretty much spends all of her time helping people get chartered within um, CAOB. Um, and I'm also Chair of um, CAOB in Northern Ireland. So what I'm going to do this evening, I am a professional review assessor as well. I have um, helped a number of people go through the, the, the process over the years. Um, so I'm going to take you through a fairly brief um, overview and hopefully give you some um, helpful hints and a little bit of direction. Um, I realise that many of you might be at different stages. Some of you might just be thinking about going down the route. Some of you might have already started. Um, and again, you'll, some of you will be from different backgrounds. So hopefully there'll be a little bit in this um, for everybody this evening. And as Wilma has said, whether you put the questions up in the chat box or you, you, you want to ask me some questions at the end, um, I'll certainly be, be happy to do that. So what we're going to go through this evening, um, we'll start just to hopefully something that you've already been through, but we'll look a little bit about eligibility. Uh, we'll talk about the, the APEL process, which might be suitable for some of you, but you'll find out about that as well. We'll go through the process involved um, with PR, so step by step, and the documents that you will need uh, to gather together uh, for the process. We'll give you some hints, um, and there's no better way to show you what's good and what's bad by actually giving you a couple of examples and, and, and talking about what should what sort of things should be in your applications. Um, uh, then towards the end, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the additional assistance, whether you um, use the CIOB resources or you come through a, a, a provider such as ourselves. I'll give you a bit more information on that. And then at the end, there'll be plenty of time for, for any questions. So let's start with eligibility. Um, now, I imagine that most, if not all of you, have spoken to CIOB um, and, and determined that um, you're eligible for um, the professional review. Um, that's obviously something important that you should do because you don't want to uh, start the process, download the form, start filling them in and then find out that, that you're not quite ready for it or, or that you don't meet their criteria. In general terms, what you should be looking um, at least three years um, construction management experience. Now, just to make clear, um, because some people maybe misinterpret what we mean by, by management, that doesn't mean that you need to have, uh, you know, be managing a team of people or be in charge of a department or, um, you know, single-handedly looking after a project or, or something like that. It just means that you've got a level of responsibility. So something you'll hear me touch on quite a lot um, this evening is you know, we, we recognize and we see that there are people from all sorts of, of backgrounds. You know, not, not everybody's a site manager, a contracts manager. We get QSs, we, you know, we get planners, we get people who work for clients, um, we get people who are consultants. Um, and sometimes you might think, well, is, is this for me? The short answer is it's for everybody. Um, and, um, you know, 
don't be put off by thinking that that you know you, you need to have a, a senior position to be to be going for this. But what you do need, you need to show that you've some area of responsibility. Um, also, obviously, you need um, a suitable level of academic qualification. Um, um, people come to the professional review process from a, a wide range of academic routes. Uh, some of you have maybe sat the CIOB's own um, exams, the Chartered Membership Program. Uh, a lot of you probably will have a, a, a construction management or recognized construction management degree. Some of you might have come the NVQ or the SVQ route. Um, also, sometimes people can come into um, construction from, from different backgrounds, different occupations, different academic routes. So uh, if you are uh, maybe somebody you might have a non-construction degree, um, which we do actually see a lot more of these days, people particularly working in, in maybe project management roles or bid management, things like that, maybe have a, a business degree. We've, we've got all sorts of um, unusual types of degrees that people come that is what we call the non-cognate route. You need a little bit more experience to do that, but it certainly doesn't bar you from going for your, your professional review and chartership. And again, there's all sorts of other things. People may have done post-grad diplomas, MSc. So the bottom line is, I would always say, go to CIOB first. Um, CIOB team in Scotland are, are very good at, at getting that checked out for you, or indeed you, you can come to providers like us who will um, also can, can get things checked out for you. So that's the starting point. Hopefully you're all sitting there in that category. You've got at least three years managerial um, responsibility experience and you have the right level of qualification that allows you to go for your professional review. Now, the starting point, if you haven't already done it, um, is to become an applicant member first. Um, you do that by visiting the CAOB website. Um, there's there's fairly clear instructions there. Um, I hope Wilma won't mind me saying, but the website isn't always the easiest to negotiate. It's not always that straightforward to find the the the, the route that you're looking for. So again, you know, if you're struggling for that, don't suffer in silence. Lift the phone to somebody, um, and and they'll help you through. And indeed, if you if if you come through a provider like ourselves, we have a, a little separate document that we've prepared that, that takes you through step by step where to go on the website and, and what to put in and, and so on. Um, some of you may already have been members. You might have been student members. You might have held your membership for a while. You might you might have the grade like A, uh, CIOB or ICOB, Associate or Incorporated uh, within that. And, and those are also eligible for professional review. And I'll talk about APEL um, shortly as well. Um, those of you that have been students, ultimately before you have your, your form assessed, you must upgrade um, to applicant status as well. And there's a, there's a separate form for that. So look, it can be a little bit tricky working your way around the forms, but the bottom line is one way or another, before your professional review can be submitted, you need to have um, upgraded to um, applicant status. And I see Wilma has come in there and said, yes, absolutely, your local hub staff. That, that, that's what I would do. If I'm struggling on the website, just lift the phone to one of them. Now, um, I mentioned about some existing um, grades. Some of you, if you have been um, a member of CIOB for a number of years um, and you maintained your membership, and I must stress, you must have maintained it. You, you didn't let it lapse at any point. You kept paying the fees every year. Um, there is a current, let's call it a shortcut, um, to full chartered membership, which is available, and I'd encourage people to grab it. So even if you're if you're not in this position yourself tonight, if you know people that 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 maybe have this, it, 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 they they may not be aware. There is um, an accelerated way that they can become chartered. So if you have been in the grade of membership of ACIOB or ICIOB and you've kept your membership up, um, you can go through a process which should lead to you being allowed to do um, your professional review. Um, and it's shortcuts in terms of means you don't have to necessarily have that uh, qualification that I went through. Um, the only um, precursor to that is you do need to do a, it's a, it's a, a online assessment. Um, and there is a cost to it, it's £50 plus VAT. But again, so if anybody's interested in that, um, either contact through Wilma and the team or come direct to ourselves. It's a pretty short um, over uh, video call that we do with you. Um, and hopefully at the end of that, we can allow you to proceed 
um, directly to your professional review. Another thing to be clear about um, before you, you get too far in your application is to make sure that you are going down the right pathway, the right route, and therefore using the correct application form. Um, most of you, from our experience, will be um, going down the industry route, okay, and that's the that's the the uh, the longest form and and, and the most um, uh, the most often used form. Um, so if if you have got your appropriate qualification, you work in industry, that is the form that you'll be using. Some of you may have done an NVQ level seven or an SVQ level eleven. If you have there is an accelerated route for you. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment as well. And also some of you may come from an academic background. So you perhaps, you know, you're a, a, a tutor at a college or something like that. And again, there's a different form. So basically, if you're a lecturer or if you've done an NVQ7 or SVQ11, make sure it's a different form. For the rest of you, the majority of you, it will be the industry route form that you'll be looking. Now, what does the form involve? Um, so there was a, first of all, the form does get updated from time to time. We are currently working on the November 2020 form. So if any of you have been in the system for a while and you downloaded or received forms prior to that, just make sure that you are um, using the most up-to-date form because there are some changes in it. The structure hasn't changed massively, but there, there are some differences in it. Um, there are parts of it that are very self-explanatory, very easy for you to complete, starting with the personal details. Okay, so you have to put in some contact details. Um, would always suggest that you put in um, contact details, mobile phone and email, um, that... Uh, is personal to you. People do start the process and people move employment and things like that. And, and maybe they've put in their old employers, uh, work mobile or work email or whatever. So, so we would suggest that you, you know, you use contact details that will stay with you. Um, should you, should you happen to, to change employer during the process, put in your contact details, you make a declaration. Um, I'm not going to lecture you about chartership tonight, but you are, you are applying to be part of an organization that sets certain standards and you are making um, you are you are making declarations on this form about your career, about your competency and so on. Um, so you know just just be aware of what you're what you're signing up for. You, you know you, you're, you're abiding by the rules and regulations of CIOB and you're also uh, you know um, agreeing that you're going to be truthful. And put accurate information on your on your application form. There is an element of trust, but there is also um, certain checks that are carried out to make sure that what you're saying in your application is actually correct. You give us the details of your current employer, assuming that you're in employment at the minute, um, or indeed some of you may be self-employed, um, and then also you need to provide uh, the details and get the declaration from um, either your employer um, or um, a, a, a professional member of, of CIOB. If in doubt, obviously just your employer, but it does have to be signed off. Somebody that knows you, that can vouch that um, the information that you have submitted in the form um, is consistent with, with your own competency and your, your own career to date. So that's the starting point. <laughs> no marks for this, folks, but it's just information that, that, that has to be gleaned. Okay, then we get into um, the main part of, of, of the form. And you start with a brief career summary. Now, again, the career summary doesn't um, carry any marks towards your application, but you're setting the tone. Um, it's like going into an interview um, and the first thing you're asked is to tell us a few words about yourself. Okay, so that's kind of what you have to remember with the professional review, uh, you know, Many years back, whenever I got chartered, I, I had to, to write um, a, a career summary, and then I appeared in front of an interview panel. We don't do the interview panel anymore. So effectively, this is like an interview, um, albeit you're doing it through a written form. So that's like your opening statement. That, that just gives a little bit of background. 
um, your, you know, your, your application may be assessed by somebody who, who doesn't know you, doesn't know anything about you. So that's your, your initial opportunity just to set the scene, um, who you are and what have you been doing for the last few years. Um, we also need a job description. Okay, some of you will have job descriptions from um, your employer, and that will be pretty easy copy and paste. Um, some of you mightn't. Um, a little tip if you're struggling to actually think what is your, your, your job description. If you go and Google your job, um, uh, uh, you know, you'll, you'll find job adverts and things like that, and, and um, you'll probably find a, a good basis for um, a form of words that describes accurately what you do. But again, you're building a picture um, for the person that's assessing your professional review. Um, and, and the more information, the more detail you give them, um, the greater probability that you're going to be successful. Um, it's also um, suggested that you produce a project list. OK, so you will be talking about things that you have been doing in the past three years and projects that you would have been involved in. Now, granted, some of you might be in a project for a year and then you move to another project for another year and so on. Some of you might be involved in multiple projects. So what you've got to think is, what are the ones that you'll be referring to? Put them in a list and then you can refer to them as project one, project two, project three, and so on. It's a lot easier than writing the name of the project every time you mention it within your application form. So think, think of the key projects that you've been involved in the last three years and include them in the project list. Then we get into the meat and bones of the professional review report itself. Um, you have 14 sections to complete. Um, and those reflect 14 different competencies. We'll talk about those in a moment. Um, the, the, there isn't actually a named word count, but Brian, who reviews um, dozens um, of these, if not more, every year, will tell you that um, you know, roughly the space that it allows you, you type into the box and, and it won't allow you to type when you get to the bottom of the box. Um, that's going to be about six and a half thousand words. So it is a substantial piece of work. Um, um, and so it should be. Uh, so it's not something you're going to sit down one evening and do. OK, it's going to take you a little bit of time. It is something that is better done in bite sized pieces. OK, well, when you break that down, it's about 500 words um, per competency. Um, and, uh, you know, that's something that you could sit down in one sitting and, and write. So that, that's the way you should approach it. It's one of those things that lots of people, you know, they sign up for, they say they're going to do their professional review. Um, and six months later, you know, you say, well, did you never get started with that? Oh, I haven't got around to doing it yet. You, you'll never probably be lucky enough to get, you know, like a full day edit or a full weekend. Edit. That's what a lot of people say. I'll wait to the weekend. I'll wait to the holidays. Don't start it and do it bit by bit. And it's amazing how you can, you can chip away at it and get it done. So you do have a fair bit of writing in front of you. Um, you also will be expected to look at a personal development plan. Part of being chartered uh, means that you keep yourself relevant. You keep yourself up to date, right? So I got chartered on the back of a degree that I graduated in what, 1994. Some of what I learned then may still be relevant, but an awful lot of it is not. I can't rest on a qualification, you know, I did almost 30 years ago. Um, I've got to keep myself current and all chartered members have to do that. So you have to show that you've given a bit of thought into what would I like to do in the next 12 months? Nobody's going to come back and check on this. Okay. Except that all of us as members of CAB have an obligation to do continual professional development and we have to keep a record of it, but it's not like somebody's going to come back to you in six months and said on your report, you said you would do this training course and you didn't, but, sit there almost as if you're sitting with your line manager discussing what would you like to do in the next 12 months? I'd like to find out a bit more about BIM. I'd, I'd like to understand a bit more about sustainable construction. What, what, are the, what are the areas, whether it's going on a training course, whether it's personal study, attending exhibitions, whatever it might be, what are you, where, where are you improving yourself? Where are you taking the next steps? So that's an aspirational um, form that you're thinking, what would I like to do over the next 12 months? Um, also, what you will need is an organizational structure, an organizational chart. Now, some of you, that will be very easy. 
Um, you will have ready the prepared, maybe for your project, maybe for your company and so on. Some of you might be self-employed and you say, well, there's just me. Well, that's okay. Show who you interact with. Um, you know, you must presumably have a client or clients. Maybe you have advisors, maybe you have associates, other people that you work with. Again, what you're trying to do is build as much as a picture as possible for the assessor to understand what it is you do and who you interact with. Um, still on the form of CPD, Continuing Professional uh, Development, um, you used to have to submit this regardless. Now you only have to submit it if you have been a CAOB member. So if you have been in membership for the past 12 months at, at any level, you also need to submit a very basic um, overview of what you have done in the past 12 months. If you've been studying, if you've been doing your chartered membership program, if you've been going on health and safety refresher courses, things like that, that all counts towards it. But there's a pretty generous, generous, generous um, uh, definition of what CPD is. It's, you know, personal study, reading trade magazines, all those sorts of things count towards your, your CPD. So if you've been in membership for the past 12 months, give a list of, of the types of CPD and the hours that you've been doing during that period. Now, I did mention a couple of other um, forms just to briefly go back to those. If you have done your NVQ level seven um, or the Scottish equivalent, there is an accelerated process for you. You'll see your six and a half thousand words drops to 1400 words. I don't know if we have anybody in that category tonight, but if you do, it's the accelerated process you do. Um, you only have to address three competencies. You know, that, that, that cuts it down significantly, as you can see. A couple of conditions for that. Your assessor that signed off your NVQ or your SVQ must have been MCIOB. So you'll have to find out, confirm who your assessor was and make sure that they are MCIOB. And you must have done it within the past three years. If you haven't, I'm afraid it's back to the full professional review for you. Also, I mentioned about academics. So examples that who would qualify for this, tutors, lecturers, teachers, NVQ assessors, some cases training and development managers, people at university doing research and so on. They also have a different form because obviously you're not maybe involved with live projects. You're, you're not able to answer the competences in the same way. So again, if, if you're involved in any of those, make sure you advise uh, CIOB and, and, and get the correct form. Now, um, what you've got to think with professional review, what you've got to remember is um, it's not a knowledge test. You've done that. You've already proved your academic um, expertise. You, you, you've got your degree. You've passed your CMP. You've passed your SVQ or, or whatever. So you, you've got the academic side in the bank already. So your professional review is not about showing off of your knowledge it's about proving that you can actually apply that knowledge and you have been doing that successfully for at least the past three years. So think about that whenever you're answering. It's not like being back at college or university where you're trying to show how much you know or how much you've researched. Um, it's showing how you put that into practice. Now, um, an organization like CAOB with its chartership, you're assessed by your peers. So it, it is people, I'm a PR assessor, Brian's a PR assessor. There, there are a number of people who are assessors. They're not people who are detached from CAB. They are construction managers, just like you. We've all been through the same process. So it's people like ourselves who sign off um, and, and assess your, your applications. There's two ways of doing it. First of all, um, you can submit directly to CIOB. Um, so you download your forms and um, you work through it. Uh, there are methods of assistance out there. Um, they're always trying to recruit mentors and, and people to, to give you a little bit of guidance. There's some uh, online resources, videos that you can watch um, and so on. You may know people um, who have been through it and it would be useful to obviously have a discussion with them as well. But pretty much it's, it's a, it's a, it's a self-help process, okay? So you, you get your forms, you read the guidance, you watch some of the videos, you might be lucky enough to get a mentor, you, you submit it, and 
you you will submit it and sit back and wait and you will get an email from CAB either telling you congratulations you've passed or referring you and there is no interview that's it you simply submit the documents um, and you'll hear back maybe in a, in a month's time or so alternatively you can do the process through a provider we're not the only one and um, there, there are others out there but obviously I'll, I'll give our own company a shout out and I'll tell you a little bit more about what's involved if you want to do it that way later on as well now, you'll have seen from what we've said so far that the 14 competencies are really, that's what you're marked on. That, that, that's, that's the most important. Um, and it's split down into sections. And the first section is your occupational competence. Um, and the clues in the name here, you are trying to become a chartered construction manager. And logically, that means two things. You need to be competent in construction and you need to be a competent manager. So the first section is really looking at your competence in construction. These are very construction specific competencies. And just briefly to go through them. So the first one, planning and organizing work, that's very much about things like how do you make sure things get done when they're supposed to be done, whether that's how you plan your daily workload, whether you are involved in programs, whether you're scheduling things, you answer it relevant to your job. Okay. So again, I emphasize, you'll see it on a later slide. Um, you know, you answer these relevant to your job. You may not work on a construction site, you may work in an office. Okay. You answer the questions relevant to what you do. So think about how you plan and organize. How do you set yourself targets? How do you measure against those targets? How do you make sure things get done satisfactorily and so on? That's what planning and organizing your work is all about. Naturally, we have a health, safety, and welfare um, competency as well. And again, we've got a, a, a good and a bad example of that, but that is the sort of things that you would expect to see in there. And remember, it doesn't matter, again, office-based, site-based, we all have some health, safety, and welfare responsibilities. It, it, it applies to all of us. And again, you answer the question, reflecting on your own input into health, safety, and welfare, even if it's just the fact of, you know, taking care for your own health and safety, observing what others are doing, reporting um, any obvious um, unsafe practices, um, you know, keeping yourself up to date with the latest regulations and so on, and actually applying those regulations. Quality is obviously something that is um, becoming, uh, you know, much more of a cornerstone of what we do. You'll see um, the, the, the emphasis on, on uh, the management of quality. So in that particular competence, don't just talk about that your company has an ISO accreditation or that you have procedures the verifier and the assessor, sorry, is interested in you, not so much your company. So people do make the mistake and, and you, can, you can tell sometimes when people have almost copied and pasted standard company procedures, you know, somebody's gone to their quality management policy and chopped a bit out and put it into their document. That's not what we're looking for. We're not assessing the company, we're assessing the individual. So talk about, if you have a quality management system, that's fine, but what does that mean for you? What, what do you have to do? Do you, do you have to do spot checks on, on materials? Do you, do, you, do you check subcontractors work? Do you take photographs, evidence? Do you fill forms out? Uh, if you work in the office, you know, do, you, do you get a report signed off by somebody else, double check before it's sent out drawings and things like that? If you're an estimator, uh, you know, what, what, what's in place to make sure that you don't make a mistake? What procedures do you have to follow? So talk about yourself and your own role um, in the quality process. Sustainability is probably one, implementing sustainable construction is one where, again, it's a, it's a very uh, topical subject, um, but you might have to take a step back and think, you know, well, what is my direct involvement in that? Just show us some awareness, show us some appreciation. You might have to look at the projects you're currently involved in and even 
talk to the design team, talk to the people that are maybe more closely involved in sustainability, say, well, what, what have we got in this project that would fall under that category? What are we, what are we doing with regards to sustainability? So what you're really doing there is you're showing that your appreciation of it, you're showing that, that you are aware of the things that are, that are going on. Some people sort of, whenever you throw that quest up, say, well, I'm not really involved. I don't design things. I just, I just build what we're told to build. Well, delve down into it a little bit look on your projects on the types of things that you don't usually have to go too far and um, to find examples good examples of, of sustainable development and the final one in your occupational competence section knowledge of commercial contractual um, and legal issues so again you don't have to be a qs you don't have to be a commercial manager but anybody in a managerial role has to have some appreciation that you know, we enter into contracts. Um, we, there are certain things that we just have to do. We have to negotiate. We have to, you know, put bids in. We have to deal with different forms of, of contracts. We have to make sure insurances are in place and, and things like that. So talk to it appropriate to your role. And again, you might say, I'm a site manager. I don't get involved in that. Well, there's certain things that you might have to do. Uh, you know, there's certain things you might have to, the QS might talk to you to, to see has a certain amount of work been um, completed before they process a payment. You know, what, what is your involvement in that? There might be certain things that you have to prepare that you, do, you don't even realize it's, it's, it's part of the legal or contractual requirements for the job. So again, that's another one that sometimes you have to think a little bit to come up with the right examples. So that's your occupational competency we then move on to your management competencies okay so it's not just about the, the 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 construction side of things you have to show that in the context of a construction manager that you have got management competencies as well so starting with communication and you know it's something that be very very few jobs in construction that you are not interfacing with lots of people obviously in the last couple of years you, you some of you might still be out in sight and doing stuff face to face but some of that these days a lot of it will be what we're doing now over video calls sending emails um different file sharing formats some of it will be internally within your own organization some of it will be externally um to cut to other companies clients other contractors members of your your supply chain some of it will be very informal some of it you might have to give presentations and um, you might have to be part of bid teams you might deliver toolbox talks you might do inductions for people you might have gone to schools and given talks basically think of all the different ways that you communicate people that you've communicated with and the mediums that you have actually used for that communication so that's usually one where it, where it's it's pretty straightforward to to get lots of examples then we move on to decision making um so you know most people are paid in construction to make decisions that we, we, our projects and our companies are not run by computers they're not run by robots we need that human decision sometimes things don't always go to plan and um, in, in construction um, the assessors recognize that things can go wrong and that's what you might have to show in decision making you know you don't always have the ideal solution you sometimes it's picking the lesser of two evils so that's what we need to see in decision making tell us about somewhere where you had a dilemma maybe a potential problem and um, Tell, talk us through your thought process and how you came up with the solution for it. Talk us through that. You, you don't have to present your entire uh, professional review assessment as if you're this perfect individual that's never had a problem and never hit uh, any issues. What we're more interested in is how did you deal with those issues? Um, and were you able to stand up and were you able to, to actually make a decision? Managing information, again, you're probably overloaded with information these days and, and you know you're constantly receiving emails phone calls drawings you maybe have access to different file sharing platforms and so on in section 323 what we're looking at is to satisfy us that you you're able to handle all that do you know where to access information do you know what to do with information do you know how to process it and pass it on you get the minutes of a meeting what do you do with those? Do you just read it yourself and note it? Have you extracts to pick out to pass on to other people? Are you are you able to process that information and decide what needs to be done with it? So 
you can refer to the, the platforms and so on that your companies might use in the procedures. But remember, we don't want to know what the platform is and how it works. We want to know how you actually make proper use of it. Leadership and strategic or financial management is one that sometimes when people see the heading, they think, oh gosh, I haven't reached that level yet. I'm not involved in that. Actually, when you, you dig down into it, what it really is all about is about plans. Okay, so have you been involved in a plan? Um, and sometimes people think, well, I'm not really sure. Well, construction phase health and safety plans, um, traffic management plans, um, quality plans, uh, you don't have to have been involved in writing the business plan for your company. If you have, great. You know that, that that's that's certainly the the section to, sh to to show it off. But what you're really trying to do in this section is to show that you recognise that what you do fits into the big picture. You know, so your company has got a um, you know a, a strategic plan to um, work in the healthcare sector. Um, you may not have been involved in writing that plan, but do you understand that maybe you are the site manager on one of those healthcare jobs and where that where you fit in the jigsaw, where you 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 fit into that whole process? So it's very much thinking about what where am I involved in in, in the bigger picture, not not just the 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 day-to-day -day job that you do. Next one is developing people or teams, and that's very much as as you would suggest what what have you done to further your own career? How have you helped other people? Um, are, are you involved in um, reviews? Um, you know, the 360 reviews or your, your annual or quarterly reviews and, and how do you set yourself targets and, and how do you improve yourself? Um, and also, where do you fit in as part of a team? Teamwork is very important in construction. Teamwork is everywhere. So tell us how you contribute to that as well. And then we have innovation. Um, you don't need to have invented something yourself, um, but you do need um, to be able to show us that you are quite comfortable and quite capable with keeping up with whether it's the latest apps that you're using, software. Sometimes we, we you know, things move so fast we, we, we don't always realise just even the fact that we are, you know, having this today via uh, Zoom instead of as Brian and, and before that myself used to come over to Glasgow or Edinburgh and, and, and deliver this face to face. Um, you know, they're, they're, we have to adapt and there's different ways of doing things. So you, it, sometimes the people who maybe work for the bigger organizations think, oh, well, that's easier for us because we can, we've got all the latest gadgets and all the latest technology and so on. But even if you're self-employed, even if you work for a smaller company, there will be things that you've brought in that you haven't used before, new materials, new products and so on. So tell us about that and, and how you've used them and, and, and the benefits that, that you've found them. You've got to show that you've been open for the future. Okay, now, then the final part, which is very important that you complete it, it doesn't, it is scored, but um, in, in relation to the first two sections, um, the, 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 the marks are not as high for these sections, even though you've, you've still a bit to write in them. Um, so they still have to be completed. Um, and this is a, a slight change of tack. This is all about professionalism and you know I said about signing up to be a member of CIOB and the responsibilities that it brings you're really confirming that in this particular section um professional judgment and responsibility you, you have to be fairly honest here um whenever you're um looking at this you know we've all been in, in, in different situations but ultimately as a member of CIOB what you're what you're trying to demonstrate is that um in certain set of circumstances you will do the right thing. And that sometimes may not be in line with what's best for you. It may not be in line with what's best for your employer, but would you do the right thing in a given situation? So there might be times maybe where, you know, it could be a simple thing like a dispute with a, a subcontractor and actually you're looking at the subcontractor and your company is saying you're not due this money and you're going, well, actually, I think the person is due that money. Or you're using your professional judgment. You know, it might be you're looking at, maybe a client is, is saying, look, I think this is defective and there's maybe, uh, you know, the, the, the easy thing for you or your company would be to dispute that, but actually you're saying, I'm looking at this and it's not right, okay? So give us some examples where, you know, you, you did what was right in, the, in a situation. And the same in, in the next section um, where you, you have to, first of all, read 
the rules and regulations of professional competence and conduct from CAB. It's not a very long document. So I think it's a, a two or three page document, but that effectively is what you are signing up to. Um, and it would be useful to make reference in that and give some examples where you have um, adhered to that. Um, and, and by doing that, you will demonstrate to the assessor that at least you, you have actually read that document. And finally, your commitment to CPD. So we talked about CPD earlier in the presentation, and that's really just putting into words your, your plans and your aspirations for, for CPD and recognizing how important it is and talking about what your potential plans are for the future um, and what you might be um, you know, putting in place and why you're putting in place for the, for the upcoming 12 months. So that is the bulk of what um, where the marks come from, that's where your six and a half thousand words are, these 14 competencies. It's important you, you get all the, the other stuff together, but this is what you are ultimately judged on and what, you, what you're marked on. Now, to preempt perhaps a, a couple of concerns that we, that we regularly get, just to emphasize, it does not matter what your job role is. Okay, so Brian and, and, and the other PR assessors, they see people from all sorts of backgrounds, all sorts of job roles, multi-million international companies down to self-employed, um, uh, you know, one-person outfits um, and, and a wide range. Um, and as it says at the bottom there, it doesn't matter. We, we have main contractors, we have subcontractors, we have clients, we have consultants, we have people from property companies, Tesco's, housing associations, councils, um, you name it. You know, if you work in the field of construction management, um, you can go forward for your chartership. Um, and it's, I'd be honest, the form probably was originally designed more in mind of people who worked in site, but you can put your responses based on your own experiences. You don't have to show a lot of on-site experience. The important thing is you show construction management experience. And again, I've mentioned about your employer and so on. You might be an employee, you might be self-employed, you might currently be unemployed. That's okay as long as you've got the relevant experience to show to put in your application form. A few hints just in terms of... Um, Again, mostly from feedback of what we see and what works and, and what, what doesn't work. Um, back stuff up with as much evidence. Convince the assessor that you really did that, okay? Um, so, you know, almost when you're writing every line, think, um, how could the assessor challenge me in that and what would my response be? We'll put it in. Um, put it in the text box, put, put enough detail in there that the, the assessor will feel comfortable that, that, that you've actually done what you've said you did. And, and that's a very simple piece of advice. Don't overthink it. Simply say what you have done. To come this far, to be approved for professional review, you must have some good experience under your belt. So that's what we want to hear about. Um, naturally, because it's all stuff that you've done, you write in the past tense. OK, so I often hear Brian talking about don't say what you would do in a situation. Tell us what you have done. OK, that's what we're interested in. We're not interested in, in how you might handle a situation. We're interested in what you have actually done. And with that in mind, we should hear or read the word I a lot. I did this. And this, again, to emphasize where we see the mistakes quite often is where people talk too much about the company, or are they talk in vague terms, or are they talk in the, the third person. It should be what you did as much as possible. And back that up with the evidence of detailed examples. Tell, give us the detail of something. Um, sometimes people say that, that that seems small or trivial. We, we want a very specific example. Oh. And we also want you to stick to the facts. Don't give us your opinion that, you know, you. Uh, Personally, I think the drive towards sustainable construction has gone too far, but well, we're not asking you to write a paper on something. We want to know what you have done, pure and simple. Um, again, just uh, on a few of the, the do's and don'ts um, on how language matters and how little things can make a big difference. So you just see the difference in the wording. I was responsible for resources. So what, um, you know, uh, I could appoint anybody to be responsible for it. Did you actually do something? I managed resources on the site. I'll tell us a bit more about that. I was involved in the program. 
mean anything from, you know, you gave your opinion at a meeting to you actually prepared it. Well, tell us what you actually did. I prepared the program. It was my role to make sure that the conditions were implemented. Well, did you? By telling us, I ensured the conditions were implemented. You're making a statement. You're making a statement of fact. And to take that a little bit further, here's a, a bad example on a, on a health and safety question. I attended an SMSTS course. Okay, um, we're, we're, we're not assessing your qualifications here. Um, we're more interested in what you put to use that you learned on the SMSTS. I know how important health and safety is. That tells us nothing. I will always ensure that the construction phase health and safety plan is followed. You're talking in the present, you're, sorry, you're talking in the future tense there. We want to know that you've actually done it. A good one always will include risk assessments and method statements. Well, that's your opinion. Okay. What, how does that tell us anything more about you? We had no accidents on any sites last year. Again, well, what's that got to do with you? Did, is it because of something you did that, that, that helped with that good health and safety record? If it is, tell us. Our company has a new comprehensive health and safety policy and make sure all workers have the right CSCS card. Again, good for your company. We're not assessing your company, we're assessing you. How have you implemented your health and safety policy? Do you check CSCS cards as part of people's inductions or when subcontractors come in? In 2016, there was an accident, but after investigation, it was not our fault. The member of the public was found to be trespassing. Again, very interesting, but absolutely no relevance to you. Were you involved in that? Did you investigate that? Can you tell us more about what your role is in it? I comply with the requirements of the CDM regulations. Well, Good for you. Everybody's supposed to comply with all health and safety legislation. Tell us specifically, what did that mean? CDM regulations requires you, for example, to give toolbox talks and inductions. Is that something that you did? Health and safety is always discussed at site meetings. Okay, but what was your involvement? Give us a specific example where you raised a health and safety issue on site and tell us what it was all about. So to flip that round properly, here's a, a, an extract from how a health and safety question could be answered better. On P1, project one, you remember we talked about having a list of projects. I prepared the construction phase health and safety plan. I ensured that I examined all the risk assessments and method statements two weeks before the subcontractor started on site. I identified one of the principal hazards was working at height. So I ensured that adequate scaffolding was provided. I carried out induction and toolbox talks regularly. That in a shorter paragraph has given me a much better indication, flavor of what you actually do, what your involvement is with health and safety. So stick to text like that. Now, also remember when you look at those 14 competencies, there's nobody out there who's an expert and has you know, the full experience in all of those competencies. What you're trying to do is make your best effort in each section. There is an overall mark. You know, you're always going to try and aim and get as high as you can in, in each section. But remember, you, you will have some that are weaker than others. Don't leave any um, white space. You know, don't, don't just write a section off and say, well, I'm not very good at that, so I'll not put much in. Do your best in all of them. But ultimately, we do accept that, that some people are going to have more experience in different areas than others. But the trick is to maximize the one that you're good at and make the best of the ones maybe that you don't have as much uh, experience in. So you're aiming to get the best overall score you can. Um, just accept that some areas, you know, you'll, you'll do better than others. And again, don't be afraid to open a dialogue with your colleagues. So if, if, if you're struggling a bit on the commercial question, go and talk to your QS or your commercial manager. If you're struggling a bit in the, the health and safety section, Try and find a few minutes to sit down and have a chat with, with whoever looks after health and safety within your organization. You, you might be surprised just how, how a lot of chat like that might, might open up some thoughts and, and give you some inspiration of, of what to put in. Now, as I've already outlined, um, you can get your PR forms, you can make use of the resources that CAOB provide you, and you can fill in your application form and you can email it off um, and get your decision. Another option for you is to come through a provider such as yourselves. I promise I won't give you too hard a sales talk, but just to, to let you know how that can work and how that might be an option for you. Um, so Training LMS are one of CIOB's small number of, of accredited PR providers. There's four of us in the company who are all PR assessors. Um, 
and we can assist um, with that process. Uh, it's possibly more than six years now we've been doing it, particularly uh, Scotland was the first place we started doing it. Um, we, we remember the very first one over in, in, in Dundee. Um, and again, I say they used to be face to face, but I have to say now, obviously with COVID, we had to move them online. And I have to say, we're you know, not in a hurry to move them back because um, actually it's working better. We used to come over and give you a couple of days in the classroom and take you through the form um, point by point and then say, send it back to us when you got it finished. Um, now what we do is we break it up um, into bite size and it works a lot better. So the way that we can help, um, we have a process where we do it on a one-to-one -one basis. Um, it starts with about an hour and a half um, of a, a Zoom or a Teams call with probably Brian, but it could be one of the others, um, who will talk you through the process, an extended version of what we've, we've talked about today. Um, and then they'll talk to you in more detail through three sections at a time. And they'll tell you to go away and work on the first three sections. And when you have them done, you email them in and your tutor will give you written feedback and also then schedule another video call with you to give you the same feedback um, face to face and allow you to uh, ask any questions and we just keep doing that until you've got all the way through all of the documents and completed all the sections it varies from candidate to candidate but typically that might be about five zoom or or teams call that are actually needed to do that um you also have access to 14 voiced over pr presentations one presentation for each of the competencies. So you can watch those in your own time before you fill in each section. And also we, we give you a bit of assistance with the applicant application process that I talked about at the start. Because we are approved by CAOB um, uh, as one of their providers and assessors, you don't actually submit your application to CAOB, you submit it to us um, and we assess it and we make a recommendation to CAOB. For our own internal quality assurance, um, if Brian, as an example, has taken you through the process, then one of his colleagues will actually do the formal assessment. So it's not the same person guiding you and then marking it. But obviously what Brian will not do is he will not let it go to another assessor until he's comfortable that it, that it will pass. It's got well over the, the line um, for chartership. Um, we upload those on a monthly basis to CIOB. They do some quality assurance checks on them, um, and then they formally write to you to confirm what we probably will already have told you. We tell you informally that we have recommended you for chartership, and about a month later, CIOB will formally notify you. We've never had anybody overturned, um, and we've never had a candidate failed who started in the process, obviously as long as they submit all of the, the documentation that, that's required. The bottom line is we will help coaching you, taking you through it until it's at a stage that it's, that it's ready to pass. Now, this figure is improving, but we have been told by CAOB that about 40% of candidates who submit directly to CAOB are referred, and sometimes they suggest that you then come along to use somebody like, like us. Um, however, a lot of people just sign up with us from the start because it's a smoother process to get your, your PR completed. A lot of people ask us about time scale. Obviously, it's very dependent on you. Um, but you know, if you really put your mind to it, you've got six and a half thousand words. If you're coming through us, you've got maybe four or five Zooms to get, um, which have to be organized. But it could be done in, in two to three months if you had a, a particular motivation to be able to get through. In terms of costs, okay, so no matter what, you'll have to pay £318. Um, that is your CAB assessment fee, whether you come to us um, or, or whether you go direct to CIOB. The only additional cost is if you want to take our remote mentoring, we charge £245 plus VAT. And that is as a result of um, negotiation with CAB Scotland a number of years ago to, to give a discount. Um, I know there's a number of people on the webinar this evening who are not from Scotland, but we do honour that. Um, if you're on this call this evening and you decide to go ahead with it, just make sure you point out you're on the CAB Scotland webinar and we drop the price from 295 to 245. So for what you're getting and ultimately chartership, um, you know, 
it's it's very useful. We, we certainly over a hundred people a year go through the process with us, and I say we've got a hundred percent success rate. So if you do want to go through, um, I'll give you contact details on the final slide, which is coming up in a moment. But I have to be honest with you too and say people quite successfully, um, you you can um do it on your own. Uh, if you've got the time and the resources, then absolutely that's a, a route that you can go as well. And um, if you come through us. We collect the 318 as well on behalf of CAB. So you don't pay that twice, you just you pay it to us. So that is the end of, of our webinar this evening. Um, I've left Brian's contact details up there. Brian is on facilitated, and thank you to Brian for doing this. Even though he, he is feeling unwell, he um, has has uh, signed on and, and to host this evening. He just won't be able to answer any questions. But I, th I think he maybe has put a couple of messages up in the chat box there. So I've put my email up. Feel free to come back to me. But also Brian's uh, is up there, including his direct phone number and mobile. Either if you just got some follow up questions that we haven't answered here this evening for you, or you want to find out more about um, the, the, the mentoring that we provide, those are the details that you can use. Um, I am looking through the chat messages just to see i think brian so max had a question um and vlad um what um, should if you answered the one for um valad uh, could you please explain what forums needed to, fill, to be filled out uh, before you can submit the pr okay so um correct me if if this isn't what you're asking there, but but basically the forms that I've gone through, um, um, and and if you if you go back to, um, sorry, I'll just go back to the relevant slides. So basically, there is the main form, um, which has all of these things on it, um, and what you might have that 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 is one form in itself. What you might might have to submit separately to that would be your organizational structure and your CPD record um, for the for the past 12 months. So really that's the, the documentation. Um, there is a checklist that 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 tells you um, what needs to be submitted with that. Um, so I think um, I know I've seen Brian seems to be still answering here, but um, Vlad, is that is that does that answer your question what you're asking there? Well, yeah, yeah, thank you very much for that. Yeah, but in the beginning, I think you said something about another form, yeah, which cost £50. And oh. uh, I just missed that bit, you know. I, okay, sorry. No, that is only if you feel you're eligible for APEL. Um, right. So if, APEL is actually for, just bring the slide up, um, APEL is for people who actually haven't um, got the full academic qualifications that they need for PR. All oh, right. Yeah, no, I've got a degree, so that's fine. Yeah, so, so oh, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, only, that's only if you don't have the academic qualifications for PR, but you have maintained your ACAOB or ICAOB, they're, they're allowing you to proceed on that. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, and Brian, Brian's put up a, a clarification about the forms there as, as well. Um, somebody's just asked about... You've already made a payment to CIOB. Uh, if it's a payment for your assessment fee, um, the, the 318 pounds, um, we have had a situation. In fact, there was a, a large builder in Scotland who have made a, a, a bulk payment for 20 of their staff. Um, and they told CIOB they'd like to do it through us and CIOB actually refunded them. Um, so you, you could ask that question if it is um, if it's your membership, that's separately. But if you've paid your assessment fee to, to CIOB, um, then if you simply contact them and say you'd like to go through a provider instead, and um, it's uh, we can give you the contact details or drop us an email, but uh, Mandy Mills has been very helpful in CIOB and, and facilitating that for us before. Um, in regards to evidence tour points, can we include external documents? Um, no, is, is, is the short answer. You've, you've, you've got to rely on what you say. Um, the assessor may come back and ask you to back up 
um, something or for more information about something if, if, if it's unclear, but you, you don't, you don't, um, uh, you, you, you don't submit anything else with it that the assessor will, will really concentrate just on what you have, you have written um, in your application form. Uh, Max, uh, the, the, the process if you're accepted, press through but fail. Well, okay, uh, I'll be selfish here, Max, and say if you come through us, we won't let it go forward until it will pass. Um, if you submit it directly to CIOB, um, you will get a, a letter back saying, sorry, you haven't met the standard. They might give you some basic feedback um, and they might say for you to wait a few months and, and consider reapplying. And in some cases, you will get an email telling you why not go and talk to one of the training providers. Um, so it's, it's not that you're barred from making another submission, um, but um, you know, you'll, you'll have to go back and take another look at it and, and see where you can improve it. If it's with us, um, you know, we, we know what you need to do to get past, and we won't let it go for submission until it's there. And if it was the assessment fee, yep, you're saying so. Um, I, if you want to drop us an email, either myself or Brian, um, as we put up on the the, the final screen there, um, we, we can give you a bit of advice about. Um, uh, you say five years experience in Africa. Nope, we have candidates. Um, all over the world. Brian has had candidates from all over the world. I've um, had a couple recently in the Middle East and China and Hong Kong. So um, absolutely, um, the, 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 um, we will be aware of that from your application form and your CV, or sorry, on your career summary. Um, we are aware that, that, you know, regulations and ways of doing things differ around the world. Um, so no, that, that, that's not a problem at all. Okay, um, is there anything that either in the presentation we haven't covered or in the questions, um, folks, that, that you've put up? Um, feel free either another chat or turn your, your, your mic on if you'd, if you'd like to, to ask a question. Hi, Roger. Can you hear Hi me? There. Hi, it's Alex here. I've, I wanted to find out uh, what's the expectation around the amount of CPD hours that's needed for the PR? Um, okay, so um, unlike some professional bodies, um, CIOB don't actually tell you a precise number of hours. Um, mm -hmm. Brian will correct me if I'm wrong in the chat box, but um, certainly I'd be, I'd be looking for more than 30 hours in a year. So, um, and you know, if, if, um, if, if you're doing any sort of studying at all, that, that, that's not difficult to get to. And remember, it's not all about studying. Um, it's, um, uh, you know, it can be self-guided learning. It can be online research. It can be reading Construction Manager magazine and, uh, and, and, and so on. So, but I, I'd be looking for a minimum of, of, of 30 hours in a year. Okay, yeah, thank you. Okay. I think CIOB are looking at tightening up on their CPD. Um, I'm not sure if Wilma's heard anything about that, but uh, nothing's been announced yet. But um, you, 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 you might find that tightened up in, 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 in future years. But at the minute, that should be enough. Yeah, they are going to um, eventually make it mandatory. Um, at present, it's not. But um, we are looking to make it mandatory. But that might take a, a year or two before that actually happens. Yeah. That's great. Okay. Thank you very much. No problem. Um, anybody else? Anything they'd like to ask? Um, somebody's asked for... Um, to, I'll get you the email address for um, the assessments to get your refund. I'll send that on to you. Great. It was, it was, it was Mandy Mills that, that dealt with the last one first, Wilma. I don't know if that's right. what you're thinking of. Uh, no, I was thinking the customer service team can help them, but um, I'll get I'll get someone to get that. I'll get that over to you. Brilliant, thanks. Okay, um, well, most people just seem to be saying thanks. So, um, if there's nothing else, um, thank you very much, everybody. And um, even if you're not coming to us to use us 
um, we're, we're all, uh, Brian and myself, we're both fellows of CIOB and we're always happy to help. So if you've got any questions about your career, anything to do with CIOB as well as Wildman and the team, um, don't be afraid to, to, to reach out to us. Hey, thanks everyone for joining and again thanks Roger and Brian thank you very much for tonight um, if anybody has any further questions um, feel free to drop Brian or Roger an email or drop myself an email and I can help you in any way I can um, and I'll also get that email over to you with the, the contact for your refund thanks again everyone for joining bye everyone that's great thanks